Uh, hello, everyone. You are all welcome to another uh, webinar presentation by the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Today, we are going to have our journal club, and um, we have a presentation by Dr. Ulrik Sidney, who is going to speak about research methodology. But uh, before we uh, get to the presentation proper, we are going to introduce ourselves. I'm going to introduce the panelists. I'll start with myself. I am Zolo Ivan. I am a CTA medical student from the University of Boya in Cameroon. I'm also the head of communication and operation at the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Next, we are going to give the floor to Darwin. Please, Darwin, can you present yourself? Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Darwin Schimba. I'm a fifth year medical student from the Copper Belt University, Zambia, and I'm a member of uh, the research department under uh, the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. I'm glad to be uh, here this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darwin. We are happy to have you. Next is our latest neurosurgeon in Africa, Dr. James Kabulo. Please, can you present yourself? Thank you so much, Zolo. My name is Kabulo. I'm a um, newly qualified neurosurgeon. Nice to meet you all. It's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Kabulo. Congratulations once more. Uh, next Thank is uh, Shadab. Oh, sorry. Next is uh, Endale Genevieve. Please, can you unmute yourself and present yourself? Good evening, everyone. My name is Endale Genevieve, fourth year medical student at the University of Boya and member of communication and operation of EFAN. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Next is uh, Shimuka. Please, Shimuka, can you present yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Tumoka, 40 medical student, University of Zambia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Gideon. Please, Gideon, can you present yourself? Um, hello all, my name is Gideon. I'm a fourth year medical student at um, Barton, the London, in London. Great, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Next is uh, Dr. Yuk. Please, Dr. Yuk, can you present yourself? I maybe stepped out. Okay, next is Dr. Kennedy. Please, Dr. Kennedy, can you present yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Kennedy uh, from the University of Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a third year neurosurgical resident. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, I want to have you, Dr. Kennedy. Next is the, uh, Dr. Natalie Gumsi. Please, can you present yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Natalie Gumsi. Uh, PGY1 uh, neurosurgery in Abidjan, and I'm also the Secretary General of uh, IFAN. Nice to meet you all. It's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Natalie. Next is Faizan. Please, Faizan, can you present yourself? Faizan Mustafa, please, can you present yourself? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Faizan Pilar Mustafa, and I'm finally a medical student from Dow University of Health Sciences, Iraqi, Pakistan. And nice to meet you all, and I am uh, very thankful to you, for me to present this session. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, next is uh, Lorraine. Please, Lorraine, can you present yourself? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorraine Silva Bella, a second year medical student in the University of Botswana. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So we are going to give the floor now to Dr. Oryx Sine. Dr. Oryx Sine, you present yourself and you will go on with your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much and thank you to everyone at attending today. So um, I'm Oryx Sidney. I'm uh, currently a research associate at Programming Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm going to be presenting, it's almost like a continuation from what we had last week, um, last two weeks or two weeks ago. Um, please this is meant to be interactive. It's not, uh, it's not just me speaking and going all the way till the end. So what we're going to do is if you have a question, two options. You can either send them in the chat box. If I don't see them, I know Zolo can always um, signal or you can raise your hand so that we are able to, uh, um, so that we can get you to ask your question. Um, so today, um, unlike the last time, last time we were talking about some really like practical aspects of research and those things are just as difficult, but you know, um, 
that is administrative, we can say. Now, what we want to talk about is uh, the methodology of research, what actually gets you to uh, come up with robust studies. And in a lot of cases, actually gets you to be published in high impact journals and even publish um, uh, more articles. The first thing um, I would like to say is there are a lot of methodologies. It's impossible to do all the research methodology in like one session. Those, those are things that you, would, you could go even to university and you wouldn't see everything. So there's just a variety of, of methodologies out there. And that's fine. You know, you only want to, what you want to do is get the basis so that you can and understand the more popular forms of research methodologies and then you can build on that. And we thought that one way to go about this would be taking it from an aspect, a perspective of Journal Club, you know, um, this way we're doing some kind of cap capacity building for Journal Club, but equally for, for research. Um, so when you, uh, one of the best ways to learn about um, research methodology actually is reading articles that have been published at, at, this, at the same time reading on the different uh, research methodologies. I cannot um, overstate this. The more you read, the better your writing, the better your methodology. The more you read, definitely, the more you will learn. So uh, make it a habit to read articles. The more articles you, you read, um, you need a lot of them, obviously, but you find that you start getting uh, more comfortable with certain concepts, right? Um, what I want to do now is go ahead with the methodology, um, the design. Now, I understand that we might not have the same um, level of, under, um, of comprehension in terms of what makes, um, uh, what is actually the research. And when we talk about methodology, a lot of it has to do with statistics. So please bear with me when I talk about things that you are very comfortable with because, you know, uh, we're not at the same level here. So um, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so last week we already spoke about one aspect. Um, we spoke about the um, uh, hierarchy of medical evidence. And when speaking about the hierarchy of medical evidence, what we said was uh, at the very bottom, what we, what we can find is um, things like opinion pieces, um, expert opinions. And as we were going up, we found that there were observational studies cross-sectional studies, we had um, case control studies, we had cohort studies, then we got into uh, things like randomized control trials, um, systematic um, reviews, and so on and so forth. And even last week, again, we were talking about um, looking at um, the report guidelines for each type of study design. Um, that is really one of the quickest ways to get an idea of what your methodology should look like because the only way you can meet all the reporting re requirements is if you have a really um, a good protocol. So please, please, please take the time to go onto the Equator network and read those reporting guidelines. And each time see if, try and think if when you were designing your study, if you actually answered those queries or if you actually met those guidelines because if you didn't, then already that is a flaw. In, uh, in the reporting, at least, that would be a flaw. Uh, now, obviously, there's other things like um, bias that we often have um, issues with. Um, talking about um, uh, uh, bias, the bias will vary a lot. And I remember, again, last week when we said, uh, well, we can have bias in terms of, um, uh, we can have bias in terms of confounders, for example, in observational studies on the one hand, and on the other hand, we can have uh, bias that are very particular to things like randomized control trials. And we said last week that um, for confounders, if you design a good and respectable uh, RCT, randomized control trial, then you, you pretty much do away uh, with the confounders and you can attribute um, effects to um, the effects that you find to your intervention. So let's do this. We're going to 
go through these really quickly. So we said, if you're going to talk about research methodology, the first thing is read. You need to read. No matter what you're trying to get into, find out if someone has published what you're trying to publish on and how they did it. Because that tells you what should be done, what is the acceptable level. If you don't do that, then you put yourself in uh, a difficult position. Everyone knows uh, a lot of this um, software, um, a lot of this um, uh, databases. Referencing management um, software, we spoke about them. We said on YouTube, you can find um, videos that will help you. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty. It's, when we talk about research today, it is important to acknowledge that we're going to have two big groups. We're going to have what we call quantitative research, and we're going to have what we call qualitative research. Between quantitative research and qualitative research, we can get a mix in equal proportions or disproportionate proportions and get what we call a mixed method research. Now, what most of us are used um, to is quantitative research, you know, dealing with numbers, talking about things like probabilities and, and p-values and etc. That's what we're used to. However, we find it, uh, those of us who have a scientific background, as most of us, are not very used to things like qualitative research. So again, we will be giving the basis to help everyone move on. And each of them have their importance in neurosurgery. They have their importance. I'm going to explain how. Let's start with quantitative research. Now, in quantitative research, um, that is the classification we had where we're like observational studies and we had randomized control trials, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and all that. The first big idea to bring to them to, to, to understand is when you're doing a study, it is difficult, if not impossible, to study your target population. And because it's not possible, what we do, we settle for a population that resembles the target population. And we call that a sample. And so we need that sample to be as closely related to a target population as possible. I know almost everyone knows that concept. But this is really important, like very, very important, very critical. Let's make sure that we break down this concept of sample, sample size, and then we can go ahead to understand why it's so important, yet so simple, but complex at the same time again. Like, so imagine right now, someone came at this very moment and decided to survey those of us here and decided that those of us right here uh, we are basically a fan and made a statement based on whatever the person found right here. Now, that person will probably be wrong because one, um, those of us who are here, uh, we usually the same kind of people, the same people that attend the sessions, uh, were a very small proportion of the whole F a fan pop, uh, group or, or body. And then the next thing is, for us to be here, we have to have certain characteristics. We have to be probably folks that are more organized or less busy. We might be too busy, but actually uh, well organized, or we might be less, we might be less busy, or we might have easy access to internet. So one of the possibilities is we have, we might have a lot of our members who don't attend because they have difficulties accessing internet or, or electricity. Now, all those things I just cited can explain why just coming to this group and saying, hey, we did this and we know this about AFAN. Well, there's a bias. You did a really poor sampling. Now, it seems so obvious with this kind of cases, but then it becomes more complex when you go to um, other things because the, the line becomes blurry. You decide to go to the hospital and you take a number of cases, um, let's say hydrocephalus, and you make conclusions about hydrocephalus. First thing is you're studying a hospital, which is a referral center. Next thing is it's actually a hospital. And you're using, for example, prevalence inside your hospital to attribute it to the population. Because you're a referral center, you get a lot of the cases sent to you. So you see more cases than might appear in the general population. So again, those kind of 
conclusions make it so difficult. And if we've all agreed that a sample needs to be representative of the target population, the next question is, how do we select a sample? And the next question equally would be, how do we um, determine how much is too much or how much is too little? And sample size is not about always getting too many. It's not about just keep adding, adding, adding. There, there comes a point where if you add more patients, you don't get more data. It's useless. And there's equally a point at which if it's too small, it doesn't give you anything. So now comes sample size calculation. Sample size calculation, as you can see on this table, here, yeah, this two by two table is uh, important to get a level of, to, to consider your level of significance or alpha and type one error. What do I mean breaking this down? We all have used the word p-value, all of us. We've heard it, we've used it. What does that mean concretely? Now, if you're talking about p-value, you're talking about a very specific type of statistics. Uh, we can divide statistics into two, frequentist statistics and Bayesian statistics. Almost all of us are used to frequentist statistics, the statistics where you talk about p-values. There's a type of statistics, which is Bayesian uh, uh, statistics, where there's no concept of p-values. And now the question is, how does that work? First, we need to understand what the p-value is. P-value literally is a probability. And um, what we do is we say, hmm, we're going to use this sample to make inferences about the target population. Um, so we might be right or we might be wrong. And we might be right in two, in two cases. We might be right by saying this doesn't exist. And we might be right and saying, in saying this exists. In the other way around, we can have that. That's what we call true positive, true negative, false positive, false negatives. Now, what we're trying to do when we decide to set a p-value or probability is that we're saying how often shall we be wrong in the sense of a type 1 error. We're going to talk about um, other forms of errors uh, as well. And what has been chosen um, historically is the 5% level. We say a p-value less than 0.05 or 5%. And what that translates to is one time out of every 20, I will be wrong. So if you multiply one, one on 20, you get 5%. And that means 95% of the time or 19 times out of 20, you will be right. And that is the reason why for a p-value of 0 0.05, your confidence interval, when you're confident that you have the right um, answer is 95%. Now, the p-value doesn't always have to be 5%. It can be lesser or it can be more. If you're taking things like systematic meta-analysis uh, uh, studies, in meta-analysis, the p-value tends to be at 10%, so a little higher. If you're taking um, larger um, um, studies with a greater population, the p-value will go, well, you have p-values, for example, of 1%. And in that case, if the p-value is 1%, then your confidence interval will be 99%. And if your p-value is 10%, your confidence interval will be 90%. So you understand that relationship between p-value and confidence interval. So the greater your p-value, the more error you're accepting and the less confidence you will have in that result. I say confidence, quotation marks. Now, why did we settle for 5%? Again, this is just for understanding. Well, before our um, computers, what was happening was Statisticians would study um, data by hand. Everything they did was calculation of hand. And doing these calculations, um, just a second, let me look. I've seen a few things in the chat. Oh, only, oh, okay, fine. So doing these calculations, what they, what they found was uh, this kind of distribution, which we introduced two weeks ago. Remember, we spoke of the normal distribution or Gaussian distribution, which is uh, dumbbell shaped, right? And in the Gaussian distribution, uh, we should have some slides in front. What we need to remember, what we just need to keep in mind right now is in the Gaussian distribution, when you have your average and you calculate the standard deviation, if you get a value that is, if you get an interval that is between your um, average plus two times your standard deviation and your average minus two times your standard deviation, 
you get 95% of the population. When we say all those things, it becomes complex. Let's take something simple. We take a group of um, individuals in, say, Zambia. We, we, we measure their heights. And we see that the average of their heights is 180 centimeters. And then we calculate the standard deviation, which I think everyone here knows how to calculate the standard deviation. You get the variance and then you get the square root. Basically what you're doing is you're saying the mean minus each value and squaring, and then you do the summation. Uh, so let's just put that aside. So standard deviation, let's say the standard deviation is 10 centimeters. Remember the mean was 180. So if you're saying um, 180 plus two times the standard deviation, that is 180 plus 20 centimeters. That becomes 200 centimeters. So keep that in mind. That's one thing. And if you say 180 minus two times the standard deviation, that is 160 centimeters. What that tells me is in the Zambian population, between 160 centimeters and 108 and 200, because 180 was the average. So between 160 to 200. I have 95% of the Zambian population. And because of that, because I have that 95% confidence interval, I can decide to work on just those values and ignore the other values. And I, 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 when I ignore them, I am accepting that they will be wrong. So I am accepting that I'll be wrong 5% of the time or one out of 20, because there is no need to try to expand all the way to 100% because you will never get there. So you have that sample, you have 95% confidence that if I have a Zambian um, individual, their height will be between 160 and, 100, um, and 200 centimeters. And then that is what we're talking about when we're talking about the p-value. Some of you might have heard that some journals are like, they don't want you to report the p-value again. They would, they would rather you report the confidence interval. And that makes sense because if you're giving the p-value, all you're saying is this was the probability of me being wrong. But with the confidence interval, you actually have the values, you actually have the numbers, which is more interesting. And from the confidence interval, we can actually say if your, your test was significant or not. So if we're talking about a simple test uh, without things like ratios, things like odds ratios or relative risk, if within the values, the, 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 the scope of the values crosses the zero, so say you had between minus four and plus seven, so there's zero included in that, then it's not significant. But if zero is, is, uh, is not included, then it's significant. If it's not included, it's not significant. But it's op this is now different when we talk about things like ratios, odd ratios, risk ratios, and so on. So if today you're reading a document and you see the 95% confidence interval, you don't need to look for the p-value. Go ahead. If it's not a ratio, again, if it's not a ratio, Look at the lower limit, at the upper limit, is zero in between. If it is, then it's not significant. If it's not, then it's significant. If there are ratios, then it's one. Your, 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 the value you're looking for is one. If these values are on both sides of the figure one, number one, and it's in terms of odds ratios, relative risk, then it's not significant. Because remember, it's ratios. Um, because it's ratios, then you're putting a a over B, if the two are equal, then it's then it means that it's not significant. We'll get we'll get to that um, further ahead. And now you see, while you will have thought of sampling as something really simple, it starts to look a little more complex. But let's boil it down um, to something uh, that we can all understand. We said a p-value tells us how often we will be wrong. I'm putting it really in simple terms. So we want to get a population that makes it in such a way that we don't miss out. Say we decided to, 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 to say 5% or one out of 20. And for example, making it simple again, we take five, only five patients. Only five patients is such a small amount that one out of 20 becomes a big deal. But if we recruited, for example, 1,000, one out of 20 becomes a really small deal. So as you will convene, um, if you want to go, um, there's going to be a relationship between what you're going to be sampling and what your p-value would be, your threshold of significance. Let's go to the next point, what we call um, the power. Now, the power is one minus the other type of error, which is the beta. And the power will help you usually 
the value here for the power is 80%. That's what you want to keep in mind. Again, usually the p-value is 5%. Usually the power is 80%. So when you're using those calculators online, they usually use those. And some of them will ask you either to put the confidence interval that you're looking for or the p-value and the power. So the power usually is 80%. And with the, with the, with the power, if a study is, has a high power, so for example, 90, 100, for example, then that study is more likely to detect small changes, small uh, uh, differences. If it has a low power, it is less likely to detect um, small changes. And please, I'm talking about changes. And what that means is with the same sample size, you might not be able to discover all the differences you're looking for. Let's put it this way, same example we had, we took a certain number of Zambians, we took their heights, and we knew that we will get a sample of say 1000 because we calculated a sample size. But when we calculated a sample size, what we were looking for was a difference in height, not a difference, for example, in weight or blood pressure. So if I use the same sample size to calculate differences in weight or blood pressure, then I might find that while the values for height are significant, for example, the values for high blood pressure are not significant. Why? Because I, when I was calculating my sample size, I calculated it for height, not for blood pressure. So again, that is important. So when you're reading a manuscript, when you're designing, you need to know, first of all, what is your primary objective? What are your secondary objectives? Secondary objectives are like, yeah, we'd like to see if, it's in, if it says something good, but your primary objective, your primary objective in that study we're talking about was height, then obviously you want to make sure that it's powered at least to detect height. You can always try to power it to detect other things, but your first objective is at least to detect the first, um, the, 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 the first target. Then the next thing is the expected effect size. Um, I'll talk about the expected effect size in this sense. Like what, there's two things we want to know how much is a difference that you can notice and how much is a difference that is important. So we've all had to measure blood pressure, I believe with the sphygmo manometer, the ones that you, the, the manual ones, right? And there's, there are lines there that give you figures. So imagine someone told you to measure the blood pressure of a patient with a sphygmo manometer and they're like, oh, the, the systolic blood pressure was 142.38. That's not possible, right? Because the instrument that they used is not um, uh, uh, sensitive enough to be able to detect things like 0 0.38. Where did you get the 0 0.38 from? Then the next thing is uh, for the effects, that, that is for the effect. The next thing would be, again in the effect, how much of a difference would you consider important? So talking about blood pressure, you decide that you take patients before a treatment, you give them a new treatment for high blood pressure, and then you take the, the blood pressure after. What would you, even if it's significant, what would you consider to say, this is worthy of, of this is of clinical interest? So someone had 160 millimeters mercury of systolic blood pressure. You give them the drug, and now they are 159. Yes, the drug works, but is it, is it significant? Yes, the p-value is significant, but is it clinically significant? Would you, would you give a drug to a patient that drops the systolic blood pressure by one millimeters mercury? Question. So you might have a study. The p-value is good, great, but you're not able to show that clinical significance because from the get-go, you, you, you didn't calculate the sample size the right way. Again, you see how this something that you would define easily and go ahead with it, it just starts to look almost complex. But like I said, if you feel overwhelmed by this, just read, the more studies you read, the more you will see how it's done. And all you have to do often is just use the, the same formula they use and then adapt the, the figures. But that's what goes into this. So from the get-go, you have to define, if I'm doing this study, for example, for blood pressure, what am I going towards? What do I want to consider significant? For example, you say, oh, I want 
a 10 millimeters mercury difference between the systolic blood pressure before and after. And that's what I will consider as important or significant. Very good. And if you have that expected effect size, you will use it to calculate your sample. So if someone goes ahead with the same population, but goes and says, I want 20 millimeters of mercury, then you both wouldn't have the same sample size. But what that means also is if you're reading a study and in their protocol, they said they wanted to detect a 20 millimeter mercury change in high blood, in blood pressure. And at the end, they're talking about a 10 millimeters mercury change and it's statistically significant and blah, blah, blah. Then you have to be like, hey, be careful with your conclusion. It's not, it doesn't mean you reject the, the, the manuscript, but it just means they should be careful with that conclusion because that's not what they set out to do. And this goes again to, you need to write your protocols. Don't start a study without writing a protocol. What are you going to do? Say it and stick to it. It's okay to have non statistically or clinically relevant um, results. Negative studies are just as important as positive studies. Um, one we, the next thing is event rate in the population. If you're studying something that is rare versus if you're studying something that is common, let's take sickle cell. If you're, if you're trying to study sickle cell disease in Scandinavia and you're trying to study sickle cell disease in Africa, you and I, agree even without knowing how to calculate a sample that it wouldn't be the same thing if you're trying to show um, something common to that population and so here you will understand the importance of things like case reports case series as well but you equally understand the limitations when you write a case report of one case a single case and you're like hmm uh, we, we found this, 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 and you're trying to say, oh, in this disease, we always have this. You only have one patient. Maybe if you had 100, you find out that there's variances, the differences in how this disease presents. Okay, so it's important because, yes, the, case, the cases are rare, but also there's an issue, which is which another issue that is, asked, that, that is um, well, can we apply this to all those who have this disease? Standard deviation, I explained this, so I think we, we already understand. Now, summary of all this. Because of all these conditions, to get a good sample size, for example, for a randomized control trial in neurosurgery, because a lot of neurosurgical diseases are less common, for example, than uh, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, other than stroke, for example. But those, a lot of uh, uh, diseases in neurosurgery are not that common, and for that reason, it is difficult and almost impossible to get a good sample size for most RCTs. So very often in, in neurosurgery, you will find out that quasi-experimental studies, studies that are almost at those, as though they're randomized controlled trials, but they're not really randomized controlled trials, or you'll find that cohort studies have been used or that case control studies have been used. That doesn't mean that the evidence is, I mean, the evidence could be better with a, with a randomized control trial, but it's not feasible. So this goes again to the other uh, stuff. I, I've, I've had this conversation with a lot of you where someone comes and is like, I want to do a systematic review. I want to do this. I mean, you do what is appropriate. Don't do it because you're interested in that methodology. Do what is appropriate in your context. Sometimes um, the randomized control trial might not be the best thing and you doing it will just put you in a difficult position, statistically and ethically. Ethically, for example, an RCT, if you were trained to treat aneurysms by open vascular and you've never done endovascular, and someone came and saw you and said, uh, we want to do a randomized control trial, you will be the neurosurgeon, you will be doing, you'll be randomizing patients to open vascular versus endovascular. Is that ethical that you would, you don't feel comfortable doing endovascular, would you let your own um, brother, sister, mom get into such a study? Probably not. So in that case, we talk about equipoise. And what I'm talking about is ethics. Even when you read a manuscript, please ask yourself that question. Was this ethical? Was this necessary? That goes in your, into the critique, but equally into your own critique. If you're going to put a study in place, always ask yourself, is this necessary? Is the benefit we're going to derive from this as good as 
um, does it outweigh the risks? And you get a lot of question marks. Very difficult things to, to ask. It's not for one person. That's why you need um, um, ethical review boards. So in conclusion for this slide, what we're saying is there's two ways to have a good conclusion. You say something is true and it's equally, is really true. You say something is false and it's really false, or you say it's true, but it's not true, or you say it's false, but it's actually true. And this is how we talk of type one error, where you think about the p-value and the alpha, type two error, where you think about things like the, um, the power. So p-value, we said usually 5%, it doesn't always have to be that. Uh, and then um, power, we said is um, 80%. In which case, the beta is 20%. And like I said, if you have questions, write them in the chat box, raise your hand. Uh, Zolo, please feel free to let me know if people are asking questions. I'm trying to go really slowly, giving as many examples as I can so that people can um, uh, follow with me. Mm, okay. Is it possible to calculate sample size without the help of a statistician? Definitely. There, there, there are... There's software out there. What I'm explaining here is to help you um, find this out. Again, like I said, if you read uh, previous studies, then it's easier because if you're reading previous studies, let's put it this way. On our, this is our list, right? Level of significance, you all know. You, you just go into pre previous studies. What did they use? Did they use 5%? Okay, use the 5% and you can justify it. Power is often 80% and then make sure that other studies used it. Expected effect size, what does the community accept as a change that is significant? That's not up to, I mean, these are not things you create. And then the event rate in the population, look at other um, studies. Has someone studied the incidence, for example, of high blood pressure or, or aneurysm rupture in your population? If they have studied it, you just say, okay, this is the incidence. So we're going to use this um, as the, this is the prevalence I, mean to, I meant to say, and we're going to use this as the event rate. And standard deviation in the population, all these things are out there. You don't have to invent anything. And they are just type online to even right now, sample size calculator, you'll see a litany of free online software. However, I'm giving you information so that you can use that software on your own. I hope I answered your question. Now, I'd like to go to the next slide. So the hierarchy of evidence, we've spoken about this. Um, uh, again, yes, these studies give you a lot of information. Um, they put you in a good position because the, the, the evidence generated, if the study is done well, is superior to all these other um, types of studies. But again, is it feasible? Is it like, do you need to do it? So it's just fine. Don't feel uh, uh, belittled. Don't feel... Um, inferior because you're not doing randomized controlled trials if your resources don't permit it. If your resources permit it and you're not doing it, then that's a problem. But if your resources do not permit it, it's fine. You will work your way up. And like I said, the methodologies for each are different. So we'll try to, to, to see as many uh, as possible. Now, the bottom of, at the bottom of the research um, ladder this here, we have opinion papers and letters. And when we think about opinion papers and letters, we see things like um, you can have opinion pieces, which will be in journals. Those will not count as publications, but those are very helpful, honestly. When you write the op-eds or, or opposite editorials, um, what you get out of it is you get a lot of feedback from um, journalists. Journalists are very good at writing compared to us. They, they make it a lot, um, a lot easier. And if you can publish a few of those and get into that habit of writing, it makes it a lot easier for you to communicate succinctly and concisely. And then you can get to that level and you can mix it with a few letters to the editor and editorials. Again, like we said um, two weeks ago, letters to the editor and editorials, besides being invited, um, you need to read a lot because you need to know the literature around your topic and it's equally easier if you're working with someone who's a specialist in that domain and someone that knows. So they're very accessible, but you just need to um, start. You, you see something like last week we were talking in a group about um, crash tree, right? Uh, um, if, you, if you see crash tree, don't just start writing if you've not read about it. You need to make sure you know everything about that literature before you start writing something. Um, but you should definitely do it feel free, write it, send it. It was published in The Lancet, right? So you can send it there to The Lancet. And if, if you've read enough, they will accept it. 
you get published in the Lancet. Yes, it's it, some people will say it's just a letter to the editor. It's a beginning, right? Um, so be patient with yourself. Now, let's go to the observational studies because this is the bread and butter of uh, research and research methodology in our context. Why? We said feasibility. Um, do we do we uh, do we Oh, sorry. I'm reading a, a question before I go ahead. Um, so this is from Bejo Takutsin. What determines your choice of p-value during a study? Now, to put it simply, when in doubt, choose um, choose the five percent threshold. If you if you if you're in doubt and you've chosen the five percent threshold, I hope at least you've read other studies to see what they've chosen. But like I said. When you choose the p-value, what you're saying is how much error you're allowing to yourself. So if you're going for a p-value, there is generally accepted p-values. Obviously, there's a science behind the choice of p-value, but generally it will be 5% for a level of studies like cross-sectional and cohort and blah, blah, blah. But if you're going into much bigger studies, then it starts going down. It can be 1% or 1 per thousand. But I would say if you're in doubt, find a study that that, that did what you're trying to do and see what they used. Very often in our case will be 5%. I hope that answers your question. Why don't I want to go into this, the, the science behind p-values? Because we're trying to go away, get away from p-values because unfortunately p-values have been misinterpreted for a long period of time where people only took p-values in the sense of, is it significant or non-significant? If you've understood what I said about probability, and we said p-value is a measure of, or probability in any case, how right or how wrong you would be. Having something come up with a p-value of 56 and saying it's not statistically significant doesn't mean it's not clinically significant. Because if what you're, you're, you're studying is impacting the mortality of patients in an adverse way and the value is so big, it's still important to report. But what people have done for a long period of time is when the p-value is not significant, they stopped reporting it, which has led to what we call publication bias. People only, re only report p-values that are statistically significant. And that's the reason why a lot of journals are trying to move away from p-value and going towards um, uh, um, um, confidence intervals, for example. And some people are even more drastic. They're like, no frequency statistic. Let's go to Bayesian. Why? Bayesian doesn't use p-values. What Bayesian does is, I hope we all did uh, probability mathematics and we all did these probabilities where we had the probability of A given B. So we learned that probability of A given B was probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B. Let's make this simple. Uh, I always give you the math and then the, the, the easy part. So if we're talking about what is the probability of having um, medical student in AFAN, given that um, the AFAN that's given those who are here right now. So that will literally be the probability of um, those who are medical students who are and members of AFAN right now, currently, and then divided by the probability of being a medical student. So that's what we call probability of A given B. So what Bahitian does is it uses information it has to predict something it doesn't know. And in that sense, the Bayesian statistic is, gives much more information than just the standard p-value. P-value just tells you, in this situation, you are testing a hypothesis. Is it, what is the probability that it's right or if it's wrong? But Bayesian goes a step, step further. It's not just probability of A. It goes ahead and then tells you more information. So if you give it something, if you give it some information, then when we said probability of A given B, it can give you the probability of something else. Again, I don't want to go too much into the weeds, but just know that this exists and know which are, um, are the weaknesses of, of um, each and every one of, um, of these. Um, um, so, so Mustafa says journals don't, won't accept negative results. Actually, that's why we can report insignificant value. That's not true, to be honest. Um, it's, 
not journals, you, you're making an absolute statement, Musafa. Um, journals do report negative values. Actually, there, is, there are journals even at the level of BMC Springer that only report negative studies. And this goes back to what we said two weeks ago. You need to know where you're submitting. If you're writing an article and you've already put in your mind that I'm sending it to this journal, it makes sense that when you send it, they don't want to publish it. Because from the get-go, you didn't consider what they're interested in. Like I said, there's, there are journals out there that only publish negative results, only. There are journals out there that only publish protocols. There are journals out there that only publish incomplete studies. There are journals out there that only publish data, no analysis, just data cleaning and everything. So, I mean, please just, you know, read, re try and, uh, and apply the, the advice we've, we've, we've given you and you'll find that, um, um, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot simpler. And if you're going to try to publish a high impact journal with a negative study, ask yourself how many people found a positive study and why, what are those reasons for which you might have a negative result? After what we said today, just about sampling, how many people do you think my friends have actually gone through the due diligence of making sure the methodology was this sound before saying, oh, I had a negative study. If your methodology is not rock solid, no one will want to publish it because other people have found a positive result. So for you to publish a negative result, like negative result is the summit of science. For you to publish a negative result, if everyone has found positive studies, um, um, results, for you to be published, you need to have everything on lockdown. Your paper needs to be like, watertight crazy like really really good that's the highest level of science for you to publish a negative result so please make sure that everything is well done in your um in your article before you try and publish those now let's go to cross-sectional studies please keep keep the questions coming uh, i like it more better this way this this way i'm sure that i'm answering your questions um so cross-sectional studies we said there were a type of um, observational study, right? And this is what a lot of us do, where uh, we go, for example, to the hospital, we look at um, data from uh, patient log books, admission books and everything, and then we go ahead and say, okay, let's try and find if um, there is a, a sort of correlation, association, depending on what the variables are. Now, when we're talking about um, cross-sectional studies, um, what we need to keep in mind about cross-sectional studies is um, the, again, observational studies in general is confounders. Let me explain what we mean here by confounders and why you want to, um, again, these are just the biases of each type of study. That, that, no study is perfect, first of all. No study, no study design is perfect. So, so what do we understand by, by, by confounding and why should you always think about it when you're, uh, you're doing your study? So you, you're investigating, uh, because we're doing uh, neurosurgery here. Let's go back to the example we had before. We are, we are investigating patients that were treated um, for vascular diseases op by open vascular and endovascular. And we say, uh, we go back into our... Uh, uh, um, our records and we just, you know, we take the patients, we take out characteristics and everything, and we're looking at their outcomes based on, based on uh, the modality of treatment they had, so retro retrospective um, study. Now, what will a confounder be in that situation? Our variables are, again, outcome, given that we know um, what kind of treatment they receive. So those are two things. We're trying to find a relationship between these two variables. So the dependent variable is the outcome. The independent variable is um, the treatment modality. A confounder would be another variable that is at the same time related to a dependent and an independent variable. So that would mean something that is affecting or affected at the same time by outcomes and equally has a relationship with the treatment variable. So 
we, we, comp we, we try to say, okay, open vascular versus endovascular. And we do a study in the entire world, globally. Now, if we're thinking low and middle income countries, low and middle income countries, it is less likely that people will have endovascular techniques because it's expensive, for example, more expensive than the open vascular. It needs um, a lot of, um, um, a lot more personnel, uh, expertise, training, and, and so on and so forth compared to uh, uh, the open vascular. Now, in, in, in this again, even if someone was able to provide um, endovascular techniques, they, they will cause either the patient themselves or insurances, they would cost um, these folks much more money, maybe 20, 30 times more money, right? So again, we are adding another, uh, another element. Now, if we're thinking about insurance, so insurance is covering for this, um, is covering for this. So insurance is a sort of financial protection. And financial protection, we, we learned that insurance is very selective of those that they cover. They make sure that before they cover you, you don't have, or you have, you have very little or no comorbidities at all. So if you have very little or no comorbidities at all, they're ready to, co to cover you. But they see that you have diabetes and you have maybe a terminal cancer and you have, and so on and so forth, they're less likely to cover you. But at the same time, the comorbidities influence on your, um, it will equally influence, again, the, um, what was I going to say? We're talking about financial protection. So the financial protection will, um, is in some way related with your comorbidities, but equally your comorbidities, um, yeah, the financial protection will equally be related to um, the kind of um, treatment that you're going to receive because it's going to influence whether you're getting open vascular or endovascular, um, or endovascular. So it's not really up to the surgeon to decide in that case, really, because the surgeon might say, yes, there's these two options, but if you're not able to pay, then he cannot offer you that treatment. And if you're going to analyze the results, you need to take into consideration how much of us proposing this treatment to these patients was influenced really by the right indication and not by things that were influencing at the same time the indication of the treatment and at the same time the outcomes of the patients. So if you have if you have those elements, then it makes it difficult to affirm to say, oh, we found a relationship where patients who were treated by endovascular had better outcomes. Maybe they had better outcomes because given that they were insured, they, they tended to have lesser comorbidities. So you would see that, for example, um, their ASA score is lower. And because the ASA score is lower, they have less comorbidities. So if you're going to treat them by any modality, be it open vascular or endovascular, they will tend to have better outcomes. For example, just giving you an example. But you see that the patients that were getting open vascular, for example, were, had less money. And these were patients that could not be covered by some form of insurance because they had more comorbidities. And you find out that these patients tend to die more. If you only focus on, oh, they received open vascular, they died. They received endovascular, they did not die. You might say, oh, endovascular is the best thing since sliced bread. But you didn't take into consideration this other element that might be impacting it. And you get a lot of these in um, observational studies. But this doesn't mean they are imperfect. You can control for them. And again, this is why you need to do a good protocol. You need to read the literature. What have people described out there as existing confounders? What have people described out there as relationships that maybe you didn't consider? And you need to make sure you collect data on them. Because if you don't collect data on a confounder, then you cannot correct for a confounder. But if you do collect data on a confounder, it's easier to correct for a confounder. And you can do that. And that's what we do when we say, for example, let's analyze the different variables, the different uh, independent variables with the dependent variable and let's see what the relationships are. When we see those that are statistically significant, then we try and see if 
between those variables themselves, they have some kind of interaction to determine if there's a confounding relationship. And then we can go to the next thing, which is, okay, these are the ones that have no confounding effect. And an RCT, literally what it does is, if you do an RCT right, you're going to distribute people truly at random. So because you're distributing people truly at random, what happens, what ends up is for the same scenario, patients, you will find out that the proportion of patients with insurance will be the same in both the open vascular and the endovascular arm. But it has to be really random. And that's why if you're reading an RCT, make sure you read how did they randomize. If they're saying something like, oh, when a patient came, we attributed one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's not random. That's a pattern that is understandable. Because if you're doing one, two, three, four, for example, it's you or if they say uh, um, we were studying, we're studying folks and uh, in the one, two, three, four, they they not even not just um, not just that. Or maybe what what they did was they um, had predefined uh, uh, numbers that they were giving themselves. It wasn't really done by a computer because the best way to do it is a computer stuff software. And the best way to even do it is the computer software is in another center. And it's only when the patient comes that they call and say, where do I um, send this patient in terms of group? And that is the randomized aspect of it. If you truly randomize all these potential confounders are so evenly distributed that they don't matter anymore. And because they are so evenly distributed, you can truly say that when we intervened and had open vascular and had endovascular on the other hand, we found this effect. And this effect can only be due to the difference between these two interventions. And then what that means is we can say this technique is better than this other technique. And that's the reason why RCT tends to be a little higher up in the, to be higher up in the hierarchy of evidence. And even when you've done the RCT, a lot of people do RCTs around the world. Now, that's when you do the systematic review with meta-analysis, where you take all the RCTs together and you start pulling together all their results and what they compared, and then go ahead to, um, uh, um, st to study and see what effect it had. Why is it important? Remember what we said in the very beginning. You need to define what your endpoint was, what you were trying to find, uh, uh, your, your sample population, and so on and so forth. If we're talking in terms of aneurysms, one of the endpoints might be death. Maybe that's the major endpoint. You're studying death. But then in secondary endpoints, you're, you're looking at things like um, rebleed. You're looking at things like um, a, a patient developing post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, and all the other complications that you, you might know. But then in another study, the end point, although they were still comparing those two methods, their primary end goal was not death. The primary end goal, for example, was rebleed. You can't just take everything and put it together and just say, oh, no, there's a very specific way of doing it. That's what we call the meta-analysis. And that's what the meta-analysis does. It tries to put all those studies on the same balance and then gives a result, but equally tells you this study had this much bias, this study had less bias, and then you can see, oh, maybe although they had this result, they had way too much bias, so their results are not that impactful. So that is about the observational studies. Let me take a quick look at the Miss Question chat section to make sure that, is it possible to see an article being published on the web which doesn't follow the norms? Yes, it is, because, um, and I'm, I don't know if you've heard in the news, every, you, with, with COVID, we've had a lot of cases like this where uh, one of the studies was about um, the effect of hydroxychloroquine in coronavirus, uh, SARS coronavirus 19. Um, so I, I think everyone heard about that, right? Where there was this one study that they basically created data. It's possible because um, though the way the paper goes is it goes to other peers, people like you and I. And if you, for example, don't know methodology and you're a peer, peer reviewer, then you might not detect it. So the study might get published when, you know, it, 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 it's not respecting um, the norms. 
it is less likely in high impact journals because when you're submitting to high impact journals, you really have the experts there, like the real experts in the domain. So it tends to be less likely. And in uh, things like predatory journals, it's just terrible because people just want to get money there. Um, they just take an article and then they don't, they don't even give you feedback on it. And you're like, oh, I got published. You, you need to make sure that um, you avoid those kinds of those kind of journals. So yes, it is possible. And that is the reason why my friend um, Takutin Berbejo, that is the reason why we do journal clubs. Journal clubs are done everywhere in the world because we understand that it's not because a study has been published that it is absolute truth. A study might be published, it is perfect in every sense, but the results it found do not apply to your patient. Let's put this simply. Again, aneurysm, treatment of aneurysm and all that. Um, those who are here who are in neurosurgery will correct me if I'm wrong. The prevalence of aneurysms is not the same in every aspect, in every part of the world. If you read on our aneurysm literature, you find out that places like Japan and Scandinavia have very different um, manifestations and prevalence of those diseases. If you take another thing like Moya Moya, not the same thing. Moya Moya that you would find in, in, in uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa especially, will not be the same way and way that you'll be finding uh, uh, in North America. Today, those who attended hydro, the hydrocephalus um, leg um, course uh, with um, the young cans, you heard it. Most of our cases of hydrocephalus are often post-infective. That's not what you will find in, in high-income countries. A lot of high-income countries, the hydrocephalus is due to aqueductal stenosis, and all those kind of things. That, not the same thing again. So you would read a study that's just like, oh, hydrocephalus, here's the treatment, here's how to do it, and you go and apply it in your context. You don't have the same reality. For them to have those results, for example, they have things like physical therapy. Do you have it? Okay, they're able to monitor patients and do like three CT scans in a night, especially in the US. Do you have it? Right? So when you're reading a study, don't just swallow everything there is the internal validity and then there's the external validity does it apply to you maybe the results you find were done by uh, an experienced neurosurgeon who has done 5,000 cases of that disease already and you have done 10 would you do the same thing as a neurosurgeon no do the do the thing that you're comfortable with i hope that answers that question um so let's go on to so just again as a reminder Please, um, cross-sectional studies, there's, there's this thing that happens very often. I've seen it in quite a lot of our papers from Africa, where people get this thing of, oh, it's cross-sectional perspective, cross-sectional retrospective. If you're talking about perspective, it's about you following that patient and collecting data at different time points. So if you created the database today, okay, and you saw each patient in the hospital once, and you didn't follow each of them, you know, you like uh, day, day 60, day, day 90, 120. You, that is not a prospective study. Yes, you're collecting data and time, good for you, but that's not a prospective study. When you say prospective study, what we expect is we're going to be reading and seeing that we met or each of our patients on the day of operation, they, uh, we, we, we collected this data maybe one week after, two weeks after, and you did that for all the patients. So if you're not doing that, avoid these terminologies because then it puts you in a difficult position and makes it even easier to reject your, your, your manuscripts. Um, so when we're talking about case controls, um, I think um, the two things I can say here are make sure you, you clearly define what a case is uh, a priori. Don't wait for you to see something and then go and say, oh, this is how we'll define it. And then make sure you define what a control is. This seems simple again, but it's very complex to define what you def what you would say is actually a case. It's very difficult. So read other articles out there. How do they define it? Um, uh, very important. Um, when we're talking about case controls, another thing you want to know is the big measure of risk in case controls is the odds ratio. And if you remember what we said, if we're talking about the odds ratio, then what we're saying is we're going to compare um, and when we're going to think about the confidence interval, right? We're not looking for um, the values overlapping zero. We're looking for the values overlapping one. Okay, so 
what you want to do is you always report your odds ratios with your um, 95 percent confidence interval if you're using a p-value um, threshold of 0 0.005 uh, 0 0.05 um, yeah so we'll always come back if we need if the needs there's need to cohort studies can be done prospectively they can equally be done um, retrospectively now talking about the tests themselves let me pull up something um, so we can all see this please just give me a second if you have questions please um, ask them why why i why i uh, pull this out Ooh, i have so many windows up here Oof. uh now I, uh, now I would like to go to this other thing, right? So at the very least, when we're talking about data analysis, what we want to do is, I, um, this is a good table to give you like, you're starting in, 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 in research and you know, you don't really understand all these statistics, blah, blah, blah. This is a good table to have. All I will do is explain what these terms mean. And if you understand them, then you will understand how, which one to choose and what this means, okay? Now, in the example we gave before, we said uh, we're going to have on the one hand outcome, um, and then we're going to have uh, an intervention for like um, subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm um, rupturing. Now, if, let's take out outcome first. Outcome, you can decide to only define binary outcome. You know, is this the yes or no? So it might be, did the patient die? Yes or no. Is the patient alive? Yes or no. That is a binary outcome. Um, it might be, you know, it might be a scale. It, it might be a score and you're getting like a scale out of it. So one of the scores we are very used to is something like the Glasgow outcome scale, for example. Um, if you're talking in terms of like uh, uh, tumor resection, a cancer, you would think of things like um, uh, the Pef Karnofsky performance scale, again, figures. Um, so basically, you can have qualitative values or you can have quantitative um, values. So we're talking in terms of the outcome. If you're saying qualitative, you see categories. There's two ways you can have called two major ways you can um, divide your qualitative values. If they have some kind of natural order to them or not, if they have a natural order, it is uh, going to be um, ordinal. If it doesn't have that natural order, it's going to be nominal. Uh, what does that mean? If you're taking the Likert scale uh, where they say, um, how much do you agree with this? You're like strongly disagree disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. There's an other there, right? If you say um, uh, you're grading a paper, you'll be like failed, you know, poor, good, or average, good, excellent, whatever. You can order that. So that's ordinal. That's different. Now, if you say something like uh, races, the races of people, so there's no race above another, so that's nominal. You can, you can organize them, you know, alphabetically or some other way. If you're talking about gender, sexes, you know, male, female, there's no other there. So that is another way. So that is qualitative, we're putting that aside. If you're saying something like, oh, is the patient dead? Yes or no? Again, nominal. Now, uh, but that is a binary um, outcome. So now another thing would be the quantitative, like I was saying, talking about things like scores or in the other example, when we spoke about blood, blood pressure, we're looking at the difference before and after the treatment. That will give you a value, right? Maybe 10 millimeters of mercury, 15, 16. So those are values. So in the quantitative aspect of things, in the quantitative side of things, and you can do the same thing for um, your independent variables. So when you're thinking about the independent variables, let's say we have, um, in an aneurysm case, we had two treatments, right? And we were thinking, we're trying to compare the two treatments where we have, um, in one case, endovascular, open vascular. In other situations, we, we can have 
multiple levels. So when I say endovascular, open vascular, those are two levels. If there are more to it, then uh, this goes into qualitative with multiple levels. So say, instead of saying open endovascular, you said, okay, endovascular will say coil, stent, pipeline, those kind of complex things. So the more you have them, the more levels you're going to you're going to be uh, manifesting, and if you have, uh, if you therefore have just two levels, these are the tests you'll be going for. If you have more than two levels, these are the tests you'll be going for. Now, the next thing I want to explain to you is what these mean. This means um, if the the values you are trying to compare are they linked in any way. So when I said a patient gets a, uh, an antihypertensive drug. That patient gets that drug, you took their blood pressure before and you took their blood pressure after. So those two values are linked. It's the same individual. You had a value before and a value after. So that will go into the dependent groups. However, if you were comparing the blood pressures of male candidates versus female candidate um, participants, then it will be independent because they're not linked. If you had identical twins, that will be dependent, for example. So this is what independent means. Dependent means, and um, that's how you make a difference. So obviously, this is the group of when you have qualitative independent variables. This is the group of when you have quantitative dependent variables. Now you get into these boxes. You see this P and NP. P means parametric. In parametric, that's what we described um, two weeks ago when we said uh, a normal having a normal distribution. So the normal distribution you can test it by very sophisticated means where. You do things like the QQ plot, blah, blah, blah. I will spare you that, okay? I'll put it as simply as this. If you're looking at the frequency of the data you have and you're trying to plot it, try and find the mean and the median. This is not, again, we can go in more into more complex stuff. If the mean and the median are equal, or you can see that graph that is like bell-shaped, you know, without being skewed or it's just a little bit, then it's parametric. If it has any distribution other than that, it is non-parametric. So the other types of distribution are uh, bimodal. Bimodal is like yes, no. It, so if you're like, uh, if you're saying how many patients died and how many didn't, if you try to plot that, you have a plot for like yes and a plot for no, and that's it. So that is not that is non-parametric. So it doesn't have that sweet curvature. If you if you have something that's exponential, a curve that's exponential. If you have something that has like um, um, uh quadratic for example that is not that is not um or um or even linear that again that is not a, a a normal distribution so in those cases you will get the non-parametric tests and this is what this here can help you do at least bivariate data analysis so here you're comparing one variable with the outcome each time and so on and so forth i'll just take a little moment to look at um, i think there's a few comments coming up um we can apply this test using r or it's only it's available in every single star software package whichever software but like again last week i said this um at this level of research I, I don't think anyone should you know be don't be among those who are excited about r if you're not excited about coding if you're not excited about coding you wouldn't make the most out of r so whichever software you have, if you go in that software, you will find this analysis where you find par non-parametric analysis, you have a parametric analysis. Or if you go on YouTube, you just type, maybe, I don't know, chi-squared test, SAS, chi-squared test, SPSS, you'll find it. If you're going to find a video telling you, click here, click here, click here, and click this. Um, next question, I'm trying to learn, uh, well, uh, you don't have to. If you want to, then you have to take the time to learn the, the coding. Um, now the, um, yeah, so why again, another thing you want to know is if you run a parametric test on a non-parametric, um, on a non-parametric data set, the software usually will not tell you, I am going to get, uh, a wrong result. It's like we say, all the computers just process, that's it, right? Garbage in, garbage out. If you do a good input, then you get a good output. If it's a poor input, you get a terrible output. So you need to know, and there's certain tests that a lot of people like to use, but they don't understand the restrictions to those tests. 
One of them is regression. You can only this very strict, uh, they are very strict, uh, uh, what was the name again? Restrictions, there are so many restrictions to using, um, uh, to be able to use um, regression. Regression, for example, you can't do it if you don't have a, a, a normal or parametric, normal and parametric are synonymous here, normal or parametric data. If you don't have homoscedasticity, um, homoscedasticity, so you have to check for that. You have to check for uh, a non-dependence between the, the, the variable, the dependent and uh, independent. So there's a number of things that you need to test before you can even dream of doing a regression analysis. But if you don't do it and you run it, the computer will give you a result. It's going to be absolute nonsense, but it will be a result. So you need to be aware of these things. And again, like I said, if, you, if you're typing QQ plot, whatever software you're using, and I encourage all of you, even from today, go download a free statistical software package. Anyone, you know, if you have money to buy some another one, buy it. Go on YouTube, type uh, normality test, and then type the name of the package. I don't know, AP info or, or, or AP data, whatever, or R, if that's what you want to use. And then you're going to see how to do it. Very easy. You can get free data from anywhere. You know, um, every paper, for example, that I published, I, I share the link in the article. So if you go in the articles that we write, you will find um, a link that you can click on and you'll find the data we use and you can do the data analysis yourself. And don't be scared. You're not going to break the software. Worst case scenarios, scenario, it doesn't work. You redownload it, it's free, right? So um, try it. So, and this was about, this was about, um, this was about this aspect. Now, these are, and this is another type of study that you might hear or find out about that is equally important in uh, neurosurgery, what we call cost effectiveness analysis. So I've put a few, a few links that, a few links that you can find here. Basically, just to make it simple, in cost effectiveness analysis, we're trying to see if there, it really is economics. We're just trying to see if whatever um, intervention we're doing, because an intervention might bring um, success on a clinical aspect. But like we said last, like we said at the beginning, if it's not affordable, then it's not useful. Imagine a treatment that can cure coma, but that costs $12 million. Well, I mean, great, but you know, it's like, why, why we don't need it? Okay, so for example, I know, yeah, Gideon is in the UK. You, you need a certain level in the UK to, for, for a drug or intervention to be covered. It needs to, to have a certain threshold of cost effectiveness. So in, in the decision analysis for economics, you have things like cost benefit analysis, cost effectiveness analysis is just one of them. In the cost effectiveness analysis, what we're doing is we have the cost, which is calculated in terms of international US dollars. It's not the US dollars even that you use here. It's very specific because what it takes into consideration is not just the monetary value at that moment, it equally compares it with what has to be traded for it. It takes into consideration uh, a good cost effectiveness analysis is not just you going to the hospital and saying, how much did you pay to the patient? That's not how it works because you have different perspectives. While a patient might go to a hospital and pay the equivalent of 50 US dollars, that's not only what was spent there. For the patient to pay 50 US dollars, someone else had to bear um, that bill, to pay for the bill. Uh, we've all seen this in Africa in the cases of um, things like uh, malaria, HIV, TB. You can easily go with your hepatitis in a lot of our hospitals and get a drug for free or for a really small price. But that drug has a really high price, right? And someone is paying for, the, for, for it. So when you're doing cost effectiveness, you take that into consideration. What that equally means is uh, if you as a neurosurgeon go uh, to in a, in, and do a, a pro bono, although you're calling it a pro bono, we still need to factor in your time and skill. So we put that into it. So a good cost effectiveness analysis has a societal perspective. So if you're going to, re to remember anything, if you hear or read about a cost effectiveness analysis, the first thing you want to see is, did they take into account every single aspect, not just the patient? Um, how much does it cost the hospital? 
um, the healthcare workers, but equally the government. How much does it cost it to uh, foot that bill? And then the next thing we look at in terms of effectiveness are measures of quality of life. So you have things like um, the uh, DALIS and QUALIS. So these are about the disability adjusted life years and the quality uh, of the lives that you, you, you've lived. And what we have here is the years of lives that you of life that you've lost and the years of life that you, you're living with disability. They've already been calculated and you can find them in these two um, registries. You can use, I, I usually use the first one. You can use the second one as well if you're interested in those. This is equally interesting to see. So literally what it does, it says, uh, when we spent this much money, we were able to avoid um, these many years of life lost or life lived with disability. Those two are important because some diseases will not kill you, but they'll make you live a life that is less than, quote unquote, less than not worth living. So if you imagine a neurosurgeon operating and everything suddenly um, has uh, maybe tetraplegia. For that person, they, although they're still alive, they're living with a disability which impacts their health sometimes even more than death. So it happens, you know, in those situations where we talk about euthanasia. And so it, the, the qualities and that is try to take that into account. And when we calculate, what we come up with is if this intervention is um, really cost effective or not. This is very, this is some really complex um, study, but you can read about it and its uh, methodologies. There's, free, there's this free software, Amua. This one you have to pay for triage pro, it's kind of expensive. But again, it's another type of study that you can get interested in and you'll be able to say, hey, um, yes, there's this treatment, it's good, but you know, it, it doesn't, it's not cost effective. And in a context, you know that that's very important. If, if, uh, if a treatment is not, if a treatment is not cost effective, then it's a bit of a, uh, an issue. Um, yes, Zolo, I think I, was, I answered Mustafa's question, right? He asked a question about SPSS, which I answered, and the other one about, um, yeah, about R. So unless I'm mistaken, I've answered that question. So we come to these um, uh, randomized control trials. Like we said, the reporting guidelines, it's always good to look at them, the consult guidelines. Obviously, they have to be registered in the RCT uh, protocol registration database. Um, some of the things we want, to, I wanted to define here for um, methodology and for you to understand is here we often talk about uh, this is very important in in our cities the concept of blinding so blinding to make it easy it means obviously that you don't know what's happening so it can be single double triple even quadruple um, so you, but you need to say who is blinded you don't just say single and double you have to say who's blinded what I mean here is a patient that doesn't know what treatment they're receiving, that's one, one form of blinding. Uh, a physician that doesn't know what treatment the patient is receiving, that's another form of blinding. A statistician that doesn't know which patient received what, that's another form of blinding. So you can have a study where the patient is blinded, the surgeon is blinded, and then the statistician is blinded. You will say, oh, this is a triple blinded study, okay? Uh, the, often we, we go around, uh, we revolve around double blinded studies. Why is this important? Because it reduces bias, right? If you, you've all heard about placebo effect, we've all heard about it. Um, so that's just one of the examples. Those are one of the things we try to reduce, but equally with the, if a, a surgeon, if a surgeon is, um, uh, uh, pro, a proponent of a, an intervention, then they're more likely to push or see things in that direction. But sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's not possible to blind how and why. One, imagine we're talking about comparing different types of shunts. Can you blind a surgeon to the type of shunt? Like how is he going to do the surgery without seeing the shunt? You cannot. Uh, and so in surgery, again, like I said, in neurosurgery, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to do a, a randomized control trial in neurosurgery, very difficult very difficult because there's so many uh, limitations to that. Um, another thing is you might blind it, but it becomes unblinded. So that's another problem. So when you're reading a study, always ask yourself, did, did, did there, were there any events of unblinding? 
And as, it's as simple as two drugs are given to a patient, but one of the drugs has a very distinct side effect. Although the, 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 the physician doesn't know, did he know that he or she knows what drugs are given, but doesn't know who received those drugs. So the, the physician is blinded. And he or she, by seeing a certain, will just know that this is group B, this is group A. So knows all the patients of group B and all the patients of group A. And so if that physician sees a lot of the side effects in one group, they can say, hmm, these patients are getting this drug, so it's unblinded. So they might not tell you that in a manuscript, but when you're reading, be careful, like, oh, oh, there's this thing that makes it in such a way that it's so difficult for them to, to blind it. So one of the ways to go around some of these issues is the modifications of RCTs, where you can do, for example, a crossover. A crossover, what is done is you have the same group, you give them one drug, for example, and then you, after they've, they, they, they've taken the drug, you record the results, you give them a period of time to wash out the drug out of their system, and then you give them the other drug, so you're crossing them over the same group. So it's not, you're not keeping the same group for the same thing. So it's a type of RCT. A stratified RCT, you, you're, you're grouping people in different uh, groups. So you can go into a group and say, we're having an RCT comparing um, open vascular, endovascular. But what we're going to do is we're going to group them into aneurysms of less than two centimeters, more than two centimeters, and so on and so forth. Um, so that again is another way you can, um, you can go about it. So uh, I think there are a few comments here. So Mustafa's question, um, if I do a literature search, especially for systematic review, then how do I manage all these articles I selected using? Um, dude, please, uh, Mustafa, take the course on, take the course on Cochrane. Um, take the full course on Cochrane. If you're going to do a systematic review, please take the full course on Cochrane. Systematic reviews are not things that, you know, anyone can do. Please take the full course. Um, so uh, Gideon's question is, how would one deal with an unblinding? Um, great question. Um, great question. So you declare it. If it happens, it happens. You declare it in your manuscript and people will have to interpret the data based on based on if it happens already, like there's not much you can do. But if, but before you can try as much as possible to avoid. And again, it goes back to saying, is it possible to have that study unblinded? And if it's not, if it's not possible, then don't do an RCT. Just do another, you can do a quasi experimental study and it's absolutely fine. And you will justify that we don't believe it's possible to do this without unblinding. Uh, but it happens, if it happens, you have to say it clearly. And that's again, why you need, you and I, when we read articles, we have to look for those things. Like, I invite all of us, all of you, if you please read on the Aruba trial, read the study called the Aruba trial, and then you probably find out there people who criticize the study. Read it and then see how they criticized it. It was a big study, a major study, a very big study for neurosurgery, but it turned out they published their results even recently, but like no one is reading it. That's how bad it, it turned out to be in the end. Um, and that reminds me because I'm talking about Aruba. Another thing is now when you're doing your treatment, anything that's prospective, one reason why prospective studies are difficult, be it randomized control trials or prospective cohorts, is that um, when you do those types of studies, you will lose patients. So when you're calculating your sample size, you need to give some kind of leeway to be able to take into consideration, like to have patients so that if you lose some patients, it's okay. Normally what we do in, uh, in these randomized control trials is we have a proportion, usually equal, or a certain proportion of patients who are getting the intervention versus the control. But you might lose a patient because they die because of the disease, or they die because of something else, or they don't come, or they abandon, or they don't, and so on and so forth. So many reasons, right? And let's take into consideration, what, again, we're, we're like, oh, we're treating patients for aneurysms, open vascular, endovascular, those two, those two modalities. And one of our patients dies of uh, a, a traffic, road traffic accident. Now, that is a problem because we are not able to see if they develop um, one of the outcomes, right? 
you can't just assume that because they died, like they wouldn't have died or they would have died. You can't do that. So what we do um, with this kind of dropout is you do, uh, you want to check that in that RCT or if you're, you're the one doing it, you want to make sure that there is, um, um, uh, wow, I'm blanking. I can't believe I, I just forgot this. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to it. There is, so it's an analysis where you, you treat the patients based on what they were supposed to receive. Um, basically. Another way you can use patients is um, intention to treat. That's what I was looking for. It's called intention to treat. You'll probably find the ITT somewhere. So if you're reading an article, it means that there was, this is how we dealt with the, the dropout. Another way patients can drop out is the side effects might be so problematic or the, the health of the patient might be uh, 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 um, jeopardized in such a way that you have to take out the, the patient. And another thing that happens is if in a randomized control trial, comparing the control and the intervention, the difference is too important, the randomized control trial has to be stopped. In one way or the other, the randomized control trial has to be stopped immediately because again, ethical principles. If you clearly see an, an amazing benefit by one of them, it has to be stopped. So again, when you're reading, look for those kind of, um, those kind of um, elements in your, in, in your um, reading. Um, uh, okay, thank you, thank you, Gideon and, uh, and Dr. Dr. Kabulu. Yes. Um, so, like I said, Aruba, Dr. Kabulu and Gideon have written it, written it there. A R U B A. Uh, I mean, go and check those studies. Some have even labeled it how not to do an RCT. I mean that, uh, but. You will go and see the list of authors. It was a group of really intelligent, you know, neurologists and neurosurgeons. So this is why I keep telling with those I work with, it's a very long road in research. You really have to be, take all your wins bit by bit. You, you, you will not learn everything in a flash. The more it's really about reading a lot, writing a lot, just keep doing it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then you'll get, you'll get there. No, no worries about that. Uh, no doubts about that. So yeah, I want to go on to, on to the next thing is, um, uh, the next thing is uh, now with, with in, a, in a systematic reviews and meta-analysis, um, again, like I said before, um, two weeks ago, Cochrane, please guys, girls, um, go onto Cochrane, train uh, if you're interested in it. And like I said again last time, you don't have to be the statistics guru, systematic review guru, and you don't have to know everything, but you need at least basis, okay? Don't try to be the expert in every single thing. And that's why you need teams. Uh, we have a group right now. You need to know those people that are ready to work, that want to work. I, all of you who are here right now want to work. That's why you're listening to this. So we can, in our group, have someone who's really good at writing, really good at doing the, the statistical analysis, another person who's but at least get you know a bit uh, a bit out of um, uh, each each element each concept. Now we reach um, qualitative studies. This is this is getting a little bit of recognition now. It used to be seen as uh, that, like meh research. People were like uh, it's not really interesting or it's not really something. But now people are like yeah we it's it's just as important because. While when we do quantitative studies, or what we explain right now, you know, we're talking about p values and or analyzing this and that. What we're doing is we're having inductive deduction, um, inductive thinking. Now this is deductive in qualitative um, studies where we try to understand human phenomenon. We're trying to explain this human phenomenon, you know, and this is really important, especially we've all seen this. One of the big things is chronic diseases, where you tell a patient, hey, um, you have high blood pressure, you risk this, 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 especially in Africa, and then they, you, you prescribe the drugs and they don't take it. It's not always because they don't have money. You know, if you're going to understand it, you will not understand it with p-values. You need interviews, uh, you need, um, so one-on-one -on -one interviews, you need focus group discussions, and so all those things are important. So we rarely have qualitative studies alone in neurosurgery. One of the big um, groups that does qualitative studies in neurosurgery is the University of Toronto group. 
which actually offers a fellowship. I invite anyone doing residency or getting into residency to uh, prepare and try and get to University of Toronto. They have a very, very good skull base and vascular neurosurgery fellowship, and they're very open to African um, graduates. They do qualitative studies as well. So you can search that study, um, Mark Bernstein, um, just type journal of neurosurgery or well neurosurgery. You find that he's done some really impressive um, qualitative studies, really good. And going into stuff that we need to understand, we need to understand that people, because it's not just, I have, I don't know, the stereotaxy, I have all of this, let me, let me start treating patients. One of them is, I think all of us, from where we, where we are from, Diseases of the nervous system, especially the brain, are looked upon in a very special way, especially things like epilepsy, right? Or, or Parkinson's disease. There's always a story. Oh, there's this person that uh, didn't like him or he did this person wrong. So that's why he had this issue. So you need those things. And if you don't understand them, then you give advice to your patients, you propose a treatment and they don't agree to your treatment. So they are just as important. And now you can have these two of quantitative plus qualitative study. Either you have the qualitative before and it informs your quantitative study, or you have the, uh, you can sandwich it. You can have it before, after. There's a different, different ways where you do it. And that's called mixed methods studies. Equally very good uh, and very, um, you know, very elegant kind of um, uh, a study that you can train on as well. One way you can use this um, concept, which is not, purely a mixed method study is when you're trying to design a survey, it's good to start, obviously the literature search, see what other people have um, identified, but it's, it's a good idea to start with qualitative studies where you, know, you speak with people or you put a group of people that you're trying to study. If you're trying to study students or trying to study uh, patients, you put them together and you, you, know, you, you discuss with them, you record, the, obviously you get their permission, you record a conversation, you're like, how do you feel about this? And you let, you're only letting them, you let them speak. And you will find out that what patients worry about, what their families worry about, is not always what we worry about. Or maybe what students worry about, is not always what a resident will worry about. And it gives you a different aspect, perspective, a spin to, to, to stuff. So once you've done that, you can actually use what they said there to inform your survey. And you put that in a methodology. And it, because I've, I've had this situation where I've had to explain to some people that while, yes, it's easy to do a, a, a survey on a Google Forms and, and share it, and some people were like, oh, but if you do it, you cannot publish it. You can publish it in some of the highest impact factor journals. Surveys get published in New England Journal of Medicine. But again, it's about the pertinence. It's not, there's no one technique that everybody just spits on or looks, no. It, you have to do it the right way, the right methodology, and make sure that the journal you're trying to reach to is actually interested in those kind of topics. Is their readership interested? So if you're interested in surveys, I'll advise you to look at the CHERIES guidelines, C-H-E-R-R-E-S, I-E-S, sorry, CHERIES, um, like the fruits. Um, and then you just, just type CHERIES survey guideline. You can read that and try and make sure that you um, are able to do that. So if you read the terrorist guideline, you'll be able to design your own um, surveys and you can do them um, pretty easily on something like Google Forms. Again, go on YouTube, watch how to design a Google Form and you'll be able to come up with a questionnaire. There's more complex stuff about um, e-surveys like um, the internal validity, which is, uh, and again, I said, read, read papers that have been published before you, you'll see it um, we have published some of those e-surveys. If you go into the methodology, we try as much as possible to be exhaustive. We try to, to, to say all those things. If it's not us, you can read other things out there, but you know, check those guidelines and, and, try, to, and try to apply them. Um, so we spoke about the mixed methods. Uh, obviously, these are the tools for data collection that you should be using. Uh, this is very important. Please create a research kit profile and an orchid. If you're interested in research, the, this is one of the quick ways to um, put yourself out there. Um, really, one of those really easy, quick and easy ways. Now, what I want to go through for the final step of this really quickly is this article. Please write down this. And uh, this is what we'll be using every time we have a journal club and we go like, 
hey, let's um, present on, on, on this, which will happen very soon. We'll be having a journal club very soon. Um, this is how we will go about this. Thank you, Dr. Kabulo, for sharing this with us. Dr. Kabulo has shared this with us a while back um, today. It's a really good article that tells you, okay, you're going through an article. These are the questions you want to look at. I'll go straight up to um, 10 questions to ask when you're critically appraising an article. Um, again, if you're able to ask these questions about someone else's article, then you can ask the same questions when you're trying to design your own article or, or study, I mean. And it, what makes it, it improves how you, you think about coming up with a study or how you contribute to a study. From the very, get, from the very beginning, is the study question relevant? And like two weeks ago, I shared that um, uh, image with you where we were going through how to determine if um, a, a study is relevant. And we use the final criteria just um, as a reminder so the final criteria is, so the feasibility, very important, right? Again, is it affordable in terms of time and money? You know, uh, those who are interested in systematic reviews, in all honesty, systematic reviews take in, in a median of 30, 30 something months, a good systematic review, a well done systematic review. It's rare that you will do it in less time. Usually if you do it in less time, probably you've not done things right. And equally needs a big team, very big team. So that is an example. So do you have those resources? Um, is the topic interesting? Not to you. Is it interesting to the rest of to the readership where you're trying to publish it? You know, is it, if, if you publish an article in a US journals, you are trying to publish an article in the US journals and you're talking about something that's happening in, in some place in Africa, it's obvious that they might not be interested in it. I mean, for a lot of them, Africa is some distant concept, right? So you need to have a spin to it that gets them connected because after all, the journal is an outlet. If the primary um, readers are not interested in the article, it doesn't mean what you're doing is not important. It just means they're not interested. Publish somewhere else, you know. So don't 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 be too don't be too focused on, on on those on those things. Is it new? So a lot of times it's like, oh, it's been done in every single country in the world, but it's not been done in my country. That's not new. It's new for those in your country, but it's not new for other people who've read everything in the world. They have read uh, hundreds of studies about those things. So now you're bringing them and another thing that will probably confirm what they already knew. For them, it's not novel. Ethical, very big problem, uh, point. So this is the final criteria. So I, and I invite each and every one of you, you can type on Google, you'll find, um, you'll find these, um, these things. So please always ask those questions. What type of research question are you asking? You know, we've come up with uh, We've spoken about the different research methods. So I think oh, today you're, you're better. Um, is it qualitative? Is it quantitative? Is it a cost effectiveness analysis? What are you trying to do? And can you do it? Um, did the study methods address the most important potential sources of bias? I tried to mention the most important sources of bias. Obviously, all those studies have other forms of bias. And all you can do is go again on PubMed, Type, for example, cross-sectional study bias. I bet you someone has published on it. You can read on I only spoke about the big ones, but has it addressed it? So someone who um, uh, could face a serious confounder bias, but didn't collect data on confounders, that is unacceptable, right? You can't let that um, slide. Was the study performed according to the original protocol? I see way too many people who don't even have protocols. That is... A, very important. Was there a protocol and was it respected? Was there a hypothesis from the get-go? Remember what we said when we spoke about this, the, 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 the sample and how you use it. If from the get-go you calculated a sample that was going to give you good data for mortality and at the end you start fidgeting with things like rebleeding, that's an issue, there's a problem, you know. You weren't, that's not what the study was powered for. That's not what it was powered for. It doesn't mean those results are not useful, but that's not what it was powered for. So um, you need to ask those questions. Um, does the study, the 
everything about hypothesis will take another time to to sit and really discuss this hypothesis and a different uh, um, data analysis. I mean, if people are okay with me continuing, yes, I can. I, we can go ahead and speak about these different um, um, hypotheses. At least give you the insights on it. But I think it's good for another session. So, um, do the data justify the conclusions? Yeah. Again, another thing. Like you, you get you get some information and you're misinterpreting. You're you're trying to apply it to every single thing on Earth. And finally, are there any conflicts of interest? Uh, so someone has the, the the basic and easy one. Someone has maybe um, is getting some kind of kickback from uh, some some company, or they they have um, stocks in a certain company, and they're telling you, hey, we need you to uh, 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 use this technique. You know, you have to be careful. You have to be careful with that. This this bias. It doesn't mean when you have bias, you cannot do research. You just have to, to tell people. And it's up to each reader to decide how and how and when they want to follow what you're, uh, what you're saying. And again, that is fair, right? It's, it's okay. You just have to say it. A lot of us don't have biases, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because biases usually mean that you're getting some kind of financial gain. You know, a lot of us, we, we're not at that level yet to have biases, so I wouldn't worry about that. No, um, so Lorraine is asking if there's a conflict of interest, would the paper be rejected? Never. You just have to say that you have a conflict of interest. That's it. it there's no, you will never, your paper will never be rejected because you have a conflict of interest. If the conflict of interest has impacted on the study, that's different. So if you did a study and your funder, your grant funder, was able to modify things in the protocol uh, after, was able to say, um, do not report this data because it's unfavorable to us. If that is found, yes, it will, it will either be retracted or not published. And retraction, please, let me say this. It's good to publish, but it's another problem, retraction. If you ever, if you, if you mix, if you do certain things, they're going to catch you after a while so be careful you know if you can always get published and gets retracted and when it gets retracted it stays on your record everybody can see it that your paper got retracted so please guys be careful um so that's it please if you have questions keep it keep them coming um this this is really i'm i'm glad that you um you are all you are all um so interested um for the statistics part um yeah, I'm, re I'm definitely um, available and ready for, depending on how, how much you, you, you're interested in it, we can definitely go through that. But I think when we'll do our journal clubs, instead of having this one session, time session, we'll take, journal, we'll take articles, you know, and we'll um, speak about them. For journal clubs, we will not be recording because um, these are, you know, dear colleagues, these are our own colleagues. We cannot post that on YouTube. We cannot be trashing down people's papers and posting on YouTube that you don't do that so that what that literally means is if you miss a journal club session then you will just have to deal with like you just have to wait for the next one i uh, will be doing it once a month i really hope that we what we've explained today each and every one of us at the very least will be able to look at a manuscript and say oh okay this is what they did this is I, i'm not quite sure you don't need to understand all everything in it but you should be able to ask questions we just want you to have that habit of saying wait wait does this is this okay is this not okay so that's it uh please please go ahead any of mustafa how do i find question you you make the question as obviously you make them but you have to inform yourself from previous studies so uh, um not all questions are mentioned in a paper like I said, you inform, like you enrich the quiz, you, you get what other people have had. If you're doing a, a survey, right? You get what people have had to say. And one of the best ways is to have a qualitative, uh, uh, an informal qualitative study before where you get that information and you put into the survey to actually make sure that the survey is answering the questions that your target population is interested in. So that, that's what you need to do. 
Yeah. Hey, you're gonna you're gonna mute yourself and go ahead. And if you have any questions, I mean, I'm done on that on that aspect. Hello, Iluik. Yes, Dr. Kabulo. Thank you, thank you so much for this great presentation. It was nice and sweet. So thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I think today I don't have a lot of questions because you answered most of my questions <laughs> already when you were presenting. So I'm just going to ask a question. I don't know if it's out of this thing. Uh, when you talk about now illustrative case, yes, where do you classify that in the hierarchy, the pyramid you showed us? Where do you classify? Where do you put it? And uh, uh, when you are like uh, sending an illustrative case to the journal, mm. do you need now to put uh, like discussion? Because I'm seeing sometimes on internet illustrative cases with uh, discussion. Others they don't even put discussion. Just abstract mm -hmm. introduction and case presentation. That's all. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kabulo. So um, the illustrative case in the hierarchy, so, so again, the hierarchy is not like um, a complete list of all methodologies. And that's why I said in the beginning that um, you can't learn everything, but what, what is being put there is like the major, um, the major study designs. Uh, so illustrative cases will be at the same level as case report, pretty much. So it, it, it's, it's like another thing you can call them is like how I do it, you know, when okay. people post, yeah, when people post those. And, and it has a lot to do with uh, uh, the journals. But like I said, the journals differ a lot, but when there's a guideline, at the very least, follow the guideline and then do what the journal will do. So some journals, when you spoke, speak about the discussion, some journals will, you will go into that um, so, um, authorship guidelines and there will, be, there will be like, we don't want a conclusion. It doesn't mean you don't write conclusion. It just means that you will conclude, but you will not have a place called conclusion. Some will be like, we don't want the word discussion. So when you have results, you go to conclusion. And in your conclusion, you will basically do discussion plus conclusion. So the structure remains the same, but the words just change a bit. Now, if someone has published an illustrative case and there's no discussion, then that's an issue. I mean, no matter how many words you have, you have to discuss what you're uh, what, what you're having. And that starts entering into the realm of where I said, you want to be careful with certain journals. Certain journals publish articles, but you know, they don't respect these things. And if for a long time you've been publishing these journals, you find that at the, mo the moment you start trying to work with um, the bigger um, impact factor journals, when you try to, to, to get your, your work there, it, it's difficult for you because these folks didn't help you in that sense, and somehow you didn't help yourself. So I think if you saw someone pu uh, publish that, and it was an actual publication, and there was no discussion at all, I mean, I, I like to see what journal it was. I think that's a bit of an issue. Thank you so much. Hmm. Hello. Yes, hi. How are you? Thank you for the presentation. It was really intriguing. So um, you you kept on referring to like every time we you know, we are not sure of, of of the statistical part of it and like the p values you refer to uh, a research done a similar research done and then we we use uh, those values. But uh, in in some cases like uh, in this era when a lot of research is actually ongoing or even not yet complete in this COVID-19 era. Like if you're trying to do a research around yeah, uh, uh, a, certain, a certain concept that has... That, that Charlie. Hello. Yes, another, a, a certain concept that has, uh, has been affected by COVID and, and you don't have similar similar research to to compare it with or to get these values what 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 then do you do um well thank you so much uh, for your question so the first thing i'll say is um actually it's the opposite covid is definitely one of the places where you will never lack research unfortunately 
I say unfortunately because that's okay. As of today, there's there are more COVID related publications right now, COVID-19 related publications than there are publications on sickle cell disease. Um, even in it's actually even getting close to the number of publications as tuberculosis, imagine. So there's a lot of things out there. And when we say similar study, it doesn't have to be the exact theme that you're having. While you're trying to study COVID, someone probably used the same methodology to study uh, uh, malaria. So you're trying to, what you're trying to do is to get, um, uh, to, to do something that has been validated. But like I said, again, p-value generally, just what you need to keep in mind, generally will be 5%, okay? I, I really don't, I'm trying to avoid to get into the nitty gritty of p-values because it is very, very vast. Like even when I was speaking before, I was trying to, I think you noticed, I was trying to avoid to use um, some of those things about the probabilities. So I'll say, what I would say for now, use 5% for now. Is that okay? It's okay, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like, um, while well, so if there's someone, okay. It's a little bit like, you, you see the, the, the table I showed you. I mean, that is a very, basic um, summary of the most the most common and simple like really basic um, statistics and um, what I've learned uh, explaining this to people is always trying to give it um, bit by bit so everyone understands we can go into things like if we're talking about distribution um, we have the normal distribution Poisson distribution binomial distribution and each of them have a specific type of um, data analysis. When I was talking about regression, for example, if you have um, data that's normal quantitative, you use a linear regression. If it's normal and uh, uh, binomial, you use a logistic regression. If it's uh, uh, a Poisson distribution type, then you use uh, a Poisson regression. If it's time to event, time to event will be, um, you're trying to measure something happened you're not just saying yes it happened or no it happened yes it happened but it happened at this time so when you say uh, oh we, we will be following patients and we'll see when they are discharged every time you're like oh discharge on post-operative day six or post-operative that is a time and an event so time to event in those cases you use things like kaplan Meier curves but that is unadjusted so then you have to use things like um the Cox proportional regression. Again, we can go down this axis and you will see it's just going to become just us opening one thing and moving to another and so on and so forth. And, and like I said, everybody doesn't have to be a statistics guru. No, it's not like just try to understand like the bare minimum and then build on it. When in doubt, read a study when in doubt, go quickly on YouTube, type it, you know, find it. And last time I said, I shared the, the website of, um, I shared the website of um, um, Marin, Marin Stark's Stats Lecture on YouTube, which is a very good YouTube. I advise everyone to subscribe to it. And when you have time, listen to Marin Stats um, speak. And for you, actually, uh, uh, um, Mustafa, because you've been asking all these questions, I said last week, um, two weeks ago, that Marine Stats Lectures was actually um, um, uh, giving tips on how to use R. So if you're really interested in using R, go on to Marine Stats Lectures. If you write it as one word, type it on, on YouTube, follow his channel, listen to the video, and you will have um, answers to all your questions. Anyone else has a question? Kind of scary. Um, well, if it's not the case, I guess Zulu, we can put an end to it right now. All right, Dr. Ori, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for the wonderful moments we spent.
thanks to you. We uh, thank all the, the panelists that could make it today. We hope to see you in our next uh, presentation. So right now I'm going to stop the recording and we can stay and chat. So thank you for coming. Mm. Um, so yes.